going to talk a little bit about ways in which you can um, analyze and visualize and understand data looking at communities of organisms. My examples are going to focus on birds, but you can use these same sorts of metrics for plants or any other group of organisms you want to look at. So when you have a question that is looking at the relationship between some variable and the numbers of species or the composition of different species in, in different environments, you're starting to look at community ecology, community analysis. And there are some, some important things to know about that when you're starting a study. For one, if you are looking at um, ecosystems and trying to compare species richness or the, the types of species in different environments, it's very, very important that your sampling actually really is close to complete as possible. And what that means is that you're actually sampling all of the potential species in that community. And this slide that I'm showing here is a comparison of numbers of species of birds in different aged or different types of habitats, basically in um, exotic tree plantation or in natural forest. And as you can see, there are a lot more species in natural forests. And actually to get that number, to get a really good estimate of numbers of species in that forest, I had to conduct many, many more surveys in that natural forest to get a more complete picture of what birds were there. And a really useful tool when you're doing this is a species accumulation curve, which is what you're seeing right here. And so you do this by, for each, a survey, whether that be uh, a square meter plot or a point count or how, however, whatever your sampling unit is, for each sample unit, you count your number of species. And as you add new samples, you, you add the number of new species that you find in each in, in your new samples. And what you tend to find is initially you have a pretty steep increase in your numbers of species, as you can see on these charts. At 10 samples across all of these environments, I was still adding new species. But as you start to collect more and more samples, you start to see an asymptote, a flattening of that curve where beyond um, a certain number of samples, you're not going to add any more species. And so that kind of plotting that information is very important to understanding if you've collected enough samples. The species accumulation curves I'm showing you here um, were gen generated using statistical software. You can do this by hand, but the statistical software will, will reshuffle your observations so that they're appearing in different order and it will give you an idea of um, confidence around those estimates. If I were to go out and do my surveys in a different order or something, I, I might see a slightly different pattern in the accumulation. And that's what this is presenting. Um, it's also really important to know that the more species you have in a community, the more rare species you're going to have. So the harder and harder it is to actually sample. And so planning out a sampling effort that really captures the numbers of species is important. So species accumulation curve is one thing that you'll be doing, learning how to generate. Um, this is just another data set from a species accumulation curves from our campus forest. We have long-term wildlife monitoring plots there. And we've had researchers or, or, or graduate students and undergraduates go out and survey these plots and you can generate a species accumulation curve of that area. Um, this one tends, is broken down by um, deciduous and coniferous forests, which I think the um, dark spot being the coniferous forest and the hardwoods being the, the white um, dots. Um, species accumulation curves do tend to have this pattern of steep exponential increase basically, followed by a flattening. And um, you'll often see in the literature, uh, people log transforming these, the axes here. And so reminding yourself about the purpose of logarithms is gonna be really important as you're going through this next exercise. So remembering the scale on a graph, if it's a log, it's really representing some sort of exponential increase. Um, this is a figure from, um, from the theory of island biogeography, actually. It's, I, I got it from the book that's cited in the slide. But this is a comparison of log area and log numbers of species. So if you think of samples as representing area, um, then, then you're looking at, as you increase your sampling area, 
getting more species. And I'm just showing you this because this, this research had the data log transformed. And what you can do when you do this is you can compare the slopes of these lines to see where you're getting a steeper increase in species richness. And this is comparing three similar types of habitat in three distinctly different geographical regions. Um, and I have done a similar thing with data looking at the relationship between species richness and numbers of listed and endangered and threatened species. And that's something you can do. And, and what you tend to see, it's fairly predictable that as you have more species, you're going to have tend to see more rare and threatened species as well. That's what these are presenting. Another way that you can visualize and understand your data, and it's an important first step in generating a diversity index, which I'll talk about, um, is you can plot your um, data set by the relative abundance of animals in the different species. So when you're going out and surveying, generally you're not just generating a species list. If you throw a square meter frame or if you do a point count, you're observing numbers of species and you're tracking how many individuals there are of each species. And that distribution of abundance and species provides some additional information about, about um, the environment. And so here, what we have plotted is the, what they call the rank abundance of species. And so you plot this in order from the most abundant species to the least abundant species. And so um, if you look in this comparative um, plot here, you have the black dots are represented by native forest, and then the red, yellow, and blue dots are different ages of exotic plantation, okay, with the yellow dots being the older plantation and the red dots being the younger, youngest form of the plantation. And what you can see is the most abundant species in the, in the very young plantation accounts for over 20% of all the birds that were counted there, okay? And then you get this very steep decline from the, and then the second most abundant species is also really abundant. But after that, the third most abundant species accounts for about 12% um, about of all the birds. And then you can go on down to the fourth, fifth. And by the time you get to the, about the sixth species, these um, birds are accounting for a very small proportion of what's observed. And so that's what we would call an uneven distribution of the abundances of the different species. By comparison, if you look at the black dots in the native forest, the very most abundant species in this native forest accounted for about, oh, geez, 7% of all the birds that were observed in terms of the numbers of individuals. And so it had a much smaller uh, a relative abundance from the most abundant to the least abundant. And so then you drop down from the first most abundant to the second most, and you have this much more gradual decline in these points in terms of the relative abundances of these different species. So that's a, an environment where the species numbers are more evenly distributed, okay? And that um, is important information that we use to calculate the diversity index. Um, this is the data. You can see the spread a little bit better if you actually um, log transform the, the data so that you can actually see these numbers that are at the, the low end. This is another way to um, represent a rank abundance. And this is again from the campus forest. And so if you look at this hardwood stands or this hardwood stands that were surveyed represented by the white bars, you have this pattern with the most abundant species accounting for, oh, just under 14% of all the birds that were observed in the hardwood stands. And then a bit of a steeper decline from there with the conifer stands being slightly more even. And so using that information, and so as you can see in these rank abundances, what we're doing is we're looking at, for each species, their total numbers divided by the total number of individual birds observed. So it's a proportion. And so you, you can use that information when you're generating a diversity index. So a diversity index is a number, it's a metric that represents basically two things about um, a, a sample, or an environment. 
and it's representing the numbers of species. So there's species richness, and that's one kind of diversity index. You can um, simply report in all, each sample I saw on an average of this many species. But if you're also taking into account um, abundances, I'm going to kind of move through these slides, then you can actually calculate, provide some more information in that number. And um, that's called a diversity index. And so a diversity index accounts for species richness as well as what they call the evenness. Uh, the distributions of the abundances of the different species in the environment. And the most commonly reported diversity index that we see is called the Shannon Index. And the equation here is, you notice there's a negative, it's important to notice that there's a negative sign. So you've, you calculate the sum of the proportion of each species that you observe, the proportional abundance of each species that's observed, times the law, natural log of that proportional abundance. So you make that calculation and you add that up for every species that you observed. You get a total, and, which tends to be a negative number, and so they, then you multiply that by a negative and um, you get a positive number. And so your Shannon's index gives uh, you this information that has both uh, information about species richness as well as relative abundance. Um, if you want to report just the evenness in an environment, actually the first step is to calculate your Shannon's index and then divide it by the natural log of the species richness of an area. And that's another way that people will report something about their environments, which environments had a more evenly distributed number of species compared to environments that had a lot of one species and not very much of other. If you want to think of it in a very simplistic way, think of a small a system with just a small number of species. Say, 10 species and in one place, it's in the two sites that you go to, there are the exact same 10 species in those two sites. But in one of them, there are 100 individuals of one of those species and only one individual of the other nine. In the other one, you see even numbers of each species. That's telling you that something, something different is going on in those two environments. And so that's where the evenness can what kind of the kind of information evenness can give you. Another thing you can do with a nice um, comprehensive um, sample of observations of species richness or um, these, this kind of data is you can estimate what your potential diversity is. So one fact about ecosystems, all ecosystems, is that most species in an ecosystem are rare. So you will find many more species that you're only going to detect in one or two surveys than you will find of really common species. There's only going to usually be one or two very common species and many, many, many rare species. And because of that, it's really hard to actually know how many total species are in an environment. But if you do co collect enough samples, you can start to get a, a, an estimate. And um, these estimators, use that information about rare species to estimate the total numbers of species. And so um, there um, are some common diversity estimators. The most commonly reported is called the Chow estimator. And in Chow, they use singletons. So these are species that are only observed in one sample that you collect, as well as doubletons. So species that are observed in only two samples. And you can plug that information in with species richness estimates to get an, a guess at how many total species there would be. Okay. And so here are some ways that you might see this information reported in the literature. So if you start to look at papers that focus on community ecology, you'll find a lot of these diversity indices and estimators reported. Here's a table from um, from the data set I've been presenting on birds in different types of forest in Borneo. And here are some basic statistics. So if you look at these young stands of exotic plantation compared to logged native forests, you have these total numbers of species that are observed that we get from our sampling. We can then plug that information in with the, the relative abundances of the species, especially the species that are only um, occurring in one or two samples, 
to get a range of estimates. So you can see in um, Acacia, they're very young forests, even though there weren't a lot of species in there. Based on my samples, the estimated numbers was somewhat higher between 51 and 63. And for the logged forest, it was also estimated to be higher than what was actually observed. What you'll find if you haven't done complete sampling is that there's this very broad range of the estimated number um, from the jackknife estimates. And then you have per point species richness, which is just the average numbers of species per point, your abundance, and then here is the Shannon's index that's reported. Okay, and so um, you can see, make some comparisons of this combination of evenness and richness using that index. And then here's um, another metric that we used in that, that study. So these kinds of information can be actually plugged into the other analyses you've been conducting so far this quarter. You can look at species richness in the format of linear regression, in the format of analysis of variance or a t-test. Um, it, it's that, that kind of information you can plug into hypothesis testing statistics that you've already learned how to do. Um, in another statistics lab, you're going to learn how to take that information about which species are occurring in which samples, as well as their relative abundances. So that's another piece of information that I have not covered here. So you might be comparing numbers of species in different environments that might be somewhat similar in terms of numbers, but the actual types of species are different. And in another statistics lab, you're going to learn how to do something that's called ordination. And that is plotting the types of species and their relative abundances by sample and comparing which samples are more similar to one another than other, compared to others. And this is just a comparison, again, of these different types of exotic tree plantation of different ages compared to native forests. And something that you might notice here is that a lot of these plantation points are clustering close together. It means that they're, regardless of their age, similar in terms of what species are found in those, those types of um, habitat. Whereas with the native forest samples, you're finding different species. None of these native forest samples are very similar to the plantation samples and a lot more variation. These points are spread apart from each other, meaning each place has a different, more different suite of species in it than, than the other sample. So um, that's some useful information and you can actually apply hypothesis testing statistics, statistics to this kind of data too. All right. That is um, diversity metrics in a nutshell, and there will be more videos going into the details and nuts and bolts of calculating some of these.